Sonic Unleashed is a genre-defining game for the Sonic series, introducing the style of gameplay, which is usually referred to as boost style, that every following 3D mainline Sonic game would be based after. But even though this game centralizes around boost so closely, how necessary is it really? Can you just avoid using it altogether? Can you beat Sonic Unleashed without boosting? First, let me explain the rules. Obviously, boosting is banned. I'm playing on PS3, meaning boost is the square button. That means the game will run like shit, sorry about that. Unfortunately, I can't just avoid the square button altogether, because unlike every other Sonic game, the homing attack isn't on the jump button, but is instead also square. Fortunately, at the beginning of the game, you must be in the air to use the homing attack, and can only be on the ground to boost, meaning we just have to avoid pressing square on the ground. If there is nothing to target with the homing attack, then you will do a jump dash. However, this only applies to half the main stages in the game. The Werehog stages take up about half the game, with a completely different control scheme that doesn't involve boost. Instead, he has the ability to dash by holding down either of the trigger buttons. To add challenge to the Werehog stages, this is also banned, although you'll soon see that it doesn't have nearly as much impact on the run. With that said, let's watch the opening cinematic, our introduction to Chip, and head right into the intro stage. This whole level is mostly an introduction to the controls. We're given plenty of safe space to get used to boosting, but it isn't actually necessary for any of the obstacles. So no challenges yet, but I do want to mention that for XP, there's no point in using it on ring energy, and I wanted to see if I could go without increasing sonic speed, so all of my XP went into the Werehog. For every hub world in the game, boosting is disabled and dashing doesn't have any use. The entrance stages are a different story, but for Apatos, we don't run into any problems, so we can just move on to Act 2. The majority of this stage is linear obstacles with a few branching paths. Even when the game gives you a prompt to boost through some enemies, this is merely a suggestion for losers. You can ignore the prompt and take them out however you please. Overall, the act is pretty easy, and in general, the normal run speed gives you more time to react to the obstacles, so we'll just move on to our first night act. For almost every single Werehog stage, dashing is usually just a way to move quicker on the ground or avoid enemy attacks. It's almost just a quality of life mechanic. I still just avoid it altogether anyway, but it won't come up often. It just makes a bunch of the platforming a bit tighter, so this stage is no problem. After meeting up with Tails and doing this shitty plane level, a bunch of story happens when you land in Spagonia, and this leads you to Missouri for another night act. This stage has you moving a bunch of boxes with handles for platforming, made slower for this run because the dash buttons increase speed when pushing or pulling them. It helps a little that when you upgrade your combat to level 4, which I did, you learn the move Aerial Claw Slash and Spin. Used by pressing square square X in the air, this move will launch you forward and also get a tiny bit of height. This makes a bunch of the platforming easier, even more than the Werehog's dash jump would. Overall, the stage doesn't cause much trouble. You can save Professor Pickle and move on to Missouri's Day Act. The beginning section is kind of a drifting tutorial, but even on a regular playthrough, boosting while drifting is a pretty bad idea. Eventually, you'll come across the first instance of wall running in the game. Normally, holding boost will keep you moving in a straighter line, but now you have to manually tilt left and right to move up and down the wall. There is a specific angle you can hold the joystick to keep yourself moving straight, it's just very precise. But there's nothing we can't handle. After beating the stage, you're immediately thrown into the game's first boss fight, the Egg Beetle. The fight will go back and forth between 3D and 2D sections. In both sections, you just need to move in or wait for Eggman, and he will eventually attack with his claws, allowing you to counter with a homing attack. The 3D section is a bit slower, but it's only a matter of time before he's taken out, leading you to the first Gaia temple and fixing the first piece of the planet. Side note, at this point I had upgraded the Werehog's combat to level 9 and didn't upgrade it further because the next four upgrades give you attacks that require dashing in some way. The next stage is in Holoska, but before that, we need to get the first of four upgrades for Sonic, the Stomping Shoes. But in order to do that, we have to get over this pool of water in the entrance stage. Boosting usually keeps you running on the surface of water, but now you only have a split second before you lose your speed and drown. You can make use of this split second and make it to the shoes with a jump dash, but this won't be enough to get through the actual stage, Cool Edge. The sections of water are way too big. Even with the help of these dash panels, you will lose speed too early. We need a way to keep our high speed without having to use boost. Thankfully, we just learned of a way in the previous stage. 
In order to drift as Sonic, you need to have a high enough speed when you press either of the trigger buttons, and then once you press one, you just hold straight left or right to drift that way. Even when running on water, drifting will lock you at a high enough speed to stay on the surface indefinitely, as long as you quickly flick the joystick between left and right. This will be our solution to every section of water in the game, because this game doesn't have any underwater sections. As for this stage, the water was all we had to worry about, so let's go back to Spagonia. You can grab the wall gym shoes here for Sonic in the entrance stage for later, but the next level is actually a night stage, and there's nothing of note to say about it. After the stage, we get a camera from Tails immediately followed by a battle in the hub world. This is simply an introduction to using the camera for these optional fights in the hub worlds, none of which I will be doing. We are then told that we need to go to Chunnan, and we need to beat another nighttime stage. Not much to say here either, but this was the first time I got up onto this dragon path which I do not recommend. But right after you finish, you have a boss fight with the Temple Guardian, Dark Guy of Phoenix. Moving between the platforms to throw water at it is still no problem without dashing, but it might be a bit tougher to dodge its attacks. So now is like one of two or three instances in the entire game where using your shield actually helps. Other than that, it's only a matter of time before he's beaten, and the second piece of the planet is repaired. Before you can continue fixing the planet, you need to investigate a couple of strange robot sightings. This takes place in the form of levels that are the exact same as the rest of the game. However, one of these stages is the daytime act in Chunnan, and this is going to be a problem. When you enter the entrance stage, you will be presented with the air boost shoes. I'll give you a second to guess what they do, that's right they let you boost in the air. With these on a no boost run, you can't just avoid pressing square on the ground anymore, cause you will always boost if you have ring energy. With these shoes, the only way to avoid boosting is if there is a target to homing attack or if you have no ring energy so you can jump dash. This means that if there's ever a point in the game where you need to jump dash, you would have to avoid all rings up until that point, which might be impossible. But I wouldn't know because I never got the air boost shoes. You need to walk into the shoes to collect them, so just don't collect them. The actual challenge here is that, to make sure you got them, you have to bounce on these springs and air boost to a platform to get to the stage, which is a required stage. But there just so happens to be another way to get on the platform. Just past where the air boost shoes are is another stack of rocks with a pole on top for the werehog to use. But if you turn the camera around, you'll see rainbow rings that you can dash into, which lead you up to a platform with an optional item. Collect it just so it's out of the way, but it's not something you'll need to use. Instead, this platform it's on is the closest to where the stage is. If you line up the corners of this platform, run for as long as you can and do a full jump and jump dash, you should just barely hit this rainbow ring to shoot you up onto the platform. I'm not sure where the best place to use your dash is exactly, but failing the jump shouldn't kill you, so you can keep trying. It just might take a few tries. This took me half an hour to discover in my original playthrough. We're very lucky it's even possible, but somehow things get worse once we enter the actual stage, Dragon Road. The first chunk of the stage is okay, and in some areas, boosting is clearly a bad idea anyway, but what really makes this stage a challenge is the following water section. We can still use our drifting technique here. Even though a bunch of the section is very narrow, we just have to flick left and right more frequently because touching any walls almost always kills you. But eventually you run into this obstacle, a rock barrier with a ramp on top in front of a pool of water. This is another point where the game checks to make sure you've collected the air boost shoes as you can simply run off the ramp and boost across the pool. But for us, this is a huge issue. The jump dash won't get us the distance we need, and while we can land on this rock barrier, we can't just run off and continue drifting. We need to get back onto the surface of the water and have enough speed to drift so that we can maintain it. Once again, we run into a very tight spot, but once again, there is a solution. There's a very strange quirk about the way the stomp works in this game. When you're still in the air and you use it, it'll send you straight down, but if you're still holding it when you land, you'll immediately immediately transition into a slide and maintain a bunch of your speed. This property of the stomp was removed in future Sonic games, but it comes in clutch here, and I'm not sure if there is another way across. Just make sure you hit these dash panels to get more speed, stomp onto the rocks where the ramp is, and just hope that it lets you drift afterward. I really wish I had better advice for getting across here, but it really just feels like random chance when it works. You just have to try it a couple times. But regardless, it is possible and we can move on. And there's just one more thing I want to say about this stage. This blue robot will appear a few times throughout the game for a chasing section. There are bombs you need to dodge when this indicator is shown, but the robot only has three attacks. Lasers you can sidestep, a shockwave you can jump, and a swing punch you can boost away to prevent him from doing, or you can slide under. 
I didn't do that here because I suck, but the punch is avoidable with a slide. Once you lose the robot, the stage is complete. In total, it took me an hour and a half to find ways to get to and also beat this stage in my original playthrough. But this finally allows us to check the other robot setting in another daytime act in Spagonia. There are two types of sections that I want to talk about for this stage. There are two sections with these green laser robots, and two sections with these giant rolling barrels. The barrel sections have two types of barrels wooden ones that you can boost through, and spiky ones. The first section seems to be designed so that you can always avoid all the barrels, even without boost, because you can sidestep or jump over all the barrels. But the second section has you running with the barrels, and you can't see the direction you are going. The section is possible, but you have to get very lucky to make it through without hitting a barrel. For the laser sections, you can normally boost into the purple robots and launch them into the laser robots to destroy them, making the section a little easier. Not only can you not do that, but the purple robots are now a very frequent obstacle that you have to avoid. The homing attack doesn't launch them up and will lock you in the air for a really long time, so you risk getting hit anyway by lasers. I personally just tried sidestepping as many as I could and tanking the others with rings in the section itself. These sections are annoying, but they don't stop us from progressing. Beating the previous two stages lets us unlock the Spagonia boss, Egg Devil Ray. The whole fight has it throwing out attacks, and it's up to you to move in and deal as much damage as you can. Getting in is a little slower, but you will chip them away eventually, letting us get to the temple and fix the next piece of the planet. Next, we go back to Haloska for a night stage to get to the temple there. And right near the start, we finally run into our first real challenge as the Werehog. This gap right here is supposed to be the tutorial for showing you the running jump, and that it gets you more distance for platforming. But in order to make sure you use it, they put this ledge that you need to grab at the other end of the gap. Thankfully, our aerial technique from earlier gets us plenty close to the ledge to grab. What? So actually, this ledge doesn't just let you grab it when you're close enough. You have to do a running jump to activate the ability to grab this specific ledge. And of course, you can't just jump over the gap on your own. Without any help, this gap is impossible to cross. Thankfully, we can get help. Introducing the Water Barrel, a completely solid object that we can move and stand on freely. This is the first one that appears in the game, placed here for you to throw at this fire robot to make it not breathe fire and dance for some reason. The game doesn't let you double jump while holding objects like this, so getting up the stairs is pretty tricky. There are slopes leading up to each step, and you can walk up them for a split second for extra height, and by jumping at the right angle, you can just barely get pushed up each slope. At the top, place the barrel on the edge, jump on top, and swing all the way across the gap, avoiding the ledge entirely. You'll just have to do it twice because of this blue keystone. Other than that, there are a bunch of these falling snow platforms, but they are super forgiving. So we can grab the key and head on to the next boss, Dark Moray. Other than being a lot more annoying because of the smaller moray heads moving around, and because you can barely dodge this ice attack, this fight is still pretty straightforward, so we can easily secure this part of the planet, which gets Professor Pickle to move to his research lab in Shamar, and unlocks the next big chunk of the game. Our next task is the Arid Sands Daytime Act here in Shamar, but before that we have to collect the fourth, but only our third and final upgrade. The Lightspeed Dash Shoes. We can use this to dash through any chain of rings, which gives us a good alternative for quick acceleration. It's helpful, but not super necessary as we don't run into any problems on the following level. The same can be said about both the nighttime and the daytime stages in Empire City. Although for the daytime, the stage has more of these two sections, but it's still not too hard to make it through. We then have two back-to-back -back night levels, one in Abadat and one in Shamar. We do come across the worst section in the game, but we don't come across any obstacles for our challenge run. This allows us to challenge the Dark Pushover, who's still super easy and doesn't put up much of a fight, even with our slower block pushing. And so, with the next temple secured, we've come down to our last two chunks of the planet. We return to Abadet for the last traditional stage in the game, Jungle Joyride. There are a few water sections during the first half, but our drifting trick gets us through all of them. A bit later, you'll come across two different obstacles in a row. One where a spike-covered ceiling lowers onto you, which you can avoid by just running straight into this break in the path, and one where the floor raises and crushes you against the ceiling. If you didn't upgrade your speed level, you won't be able to just run through here. When the floor pauses just before the top, do a quick jump dash to make it out just before you're crushed. The rest of the stage is fairly straightforward, so now let's talk about the boss. 
The Egg Lancer, which is just a recolor of the Egg Beetle, has four main sections. The first one, you just have to not land on its lasers, and then it will slash at you, allowing you to counter by boosting into it or with a homing attack. The homing attack is much weaker, but both only deal a small amount of chip damage, as it's not the main way you're supposed to attack. Next is a wall running section where it shoots its lasers through the wall and then moves them around on your side. If not for our challenge rules, you could boost into him here for more chip damage. When you come off the wall, you dodge more lasers or fire, and then it will do another attack you can counter. But in the last section, before the arena loops back to the beginning, there's a chain of action pads. The last one having a string of inputs that do this. This is the main way you're supposed to deal damage, usually getting you through the boss's three attack phases, one per loop of the arena, or two if you do perfect chip damage with boost. But what exactly is this attack? It has the same visual and audio effects as boosting, but I'm not pressing boost, and it doesn't take up any ring energy. There are good arguments for both sides on whether this does or doesn't follow the rules for the challenge, but it doesn't matter because just in case, I beat the boss without this attack. If you fail the inputs, it will still drop you into where the arena loop begins, allowing you to run through it again in the same phase until the boss's health drops enough. You can go through the stages loop as many times as you want, and since we can only do chip damage with two homing attacks per loop, we're gonna need to go through it a lot. So, after 8 loops and 10 minutes through the stage, I got hit off the wall and died. So I had to start again, and after another 12 loops and 13 and a half minutes, I beat the Egg Lancer with only the weakest form of chip damage, finally allowing us to secure the second last piece of the planet. Once we talk to Tails in the lab, we begin the last chunk of the game and explore the final region, Eggman Land. First is another airplane stage, nothing has really changed since the last one. Then you get to the actual main level and it works quite a bit different from the rest of the game, in that it's actually just one massive level that switches between daytime and nighttime multiple times. The level design itself ramps up in difficulty quite a bit, so I farmed for lives in this Spagoni entrance stage just in case. That ended up being a big waste of time because once again, even though it can be much more difficult and takes over 40 minutes, all six sections throughout the stage can't stop us. We can make it all the way through, placing the final emerald in the temple and beginning the Egg Dragoon boss fight, which yet again isn't a problem. The only attack that is demanding of speed is, well, not very demanding. And with that, it's time for the final challenge, Dark Gaia. Phase 1 is made up of three sections with two main parts. The first part of each section starts with a huge gap between you and Dark Gaia, who will throw waves of burning rocks and shoot lasers to slow you down. You need to dodge left and right to avoid the rocks or punch through them, block the lasers so they only do a small amount of chip damage, and boost forward to close the gap between you and Dark Gaia. Obviously I chose to also ban boosting as the Gaia Colossus, meaning that we have to resort to the fortunate but incredibly slow drift forward that happens automatically. After finally inching toward the boss, there's a few quick time events. While they are slow and anticlimactic in the first few sections, they will pick up speed over time and if you happen to fail any of them, you will be launched back and have to redo the approaching part again without getting any health back. After the QTEs, Dark Eye grabs you and begins the part where you play as Sonic again. All three sections give you a short time sensitive level with obstacles covering your path. If you're too slow, you get blasted and lose a life. The time limit is usually pretty generous, but with our limited mobility, the timing becomes fairly tight in each section. Just one or two mistakes could cost you a life. By the time you manage to make it through these sections, Dark Gaia has had the time to reach its full power and transform into its second phase, Perfect Dark Gaia, and begin the final section in the entire game where you play as Super Sonic. And so, you begin your slow drift forward, grabbing a few rings and dodging some meteors and attacks from Dark Gaia, and then you come across a barrier, in more ways than one. In order to defeat Dark Gaia, you have to take down this shield. In order to take down the shield, you have to destroy the snakeheads that are powering it. And in order to destroy the snakeheads, you have to boost. It's foreshadowed on the control screen before you play a supersonic. All you can do is boost. After everything we've done, abusing the most minuscule of movement quirks, barely working our way around tutorials and crawling through dozens of annoyances and inconveniences, making it all the way through the game up until the final boss is 75% complete. This is where the run ends. You cannot beat Sonic Unleashed without boosting.
While our initial challenge is impossible, there are a couple other things we proved, so let's compromise. Firstly, since the final boss is the only thing that stops us from beating the game, we did prove that you can beat the game without boosting as Modern Sonic, since you only need to as Super Sonic. Or you could say that you can beat the game without boosting in any required daytime stage. However, I haven't tried this challenge on any optional or DLC stages. Secondly, we proved that you can beat the game without collecting the air boost shoes. Since you can always boost as supersonic, I still spitefully beat the final boss in the end, with the air boost shoes still uncollected. This means that the Sonic wiki page listing them as a required item is technically wrong. And finally, you never need to dash as the werehog to beat the game, I guess. Well, thank you so much for watching. That's all for the challenge video, but I'm just gonna talk for the last minute here. This video has taken a really long time to make. If you've watched my channel before, this probably seems quite a bit different from the other videos I've uploaded, but this video is an idea I've had for a very long time. Back in like 2017 and 18 when doing video game challenges were really popular, I came up with this challenge just by looking at my own list of games. I didn't have any equipment to record it or editing software or editing skills, but I still did this challenge anyway just on my own. When I finished the run I really felt like it had good video potential, but I knew it wasn't something I could do right away. I actually did bring this up with one of the people that inspired me to do this kind of challenge. During one of GameChamp 3000's livestreams where they were attempting to beat Mega Man 3 without getting hit, I had actually brought up the idea of this challenge to them. The live streams of them practicing don't seem to be up anywhere, but they said something along the lines of, I would want to add a challenge for the Werehog as well. That's actually the reason I decided to add the no dashing rule for the Werehog, but it didn't matter all that much. When I did end up getting a capture card, I still didn't feel like doing this challenge right away, because I still wanted to have the editing skills to do this video well. As of recording this, I'm pretty much done everything and I'm fairly happy with how it turned out. I know my voiceover isn't the greatest, but I didn't feel like putting this video off any longer. And also I didn't feel like using an artificial voice. I feel like being better at voiceovers is something I'll get better at over time. For the future, I don't exactly want to make any promises on what kind of videos I'll be making, but there's a lot of games I want to play and a lot of things I want to try. I'll try to make everything I make worth your while. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you later.